This video is brought to you by Miniature Market. Thousands of board games, discounted prices, miniaturemarket.com. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here, and today I have a special treat for you. A few weeks ago at Gen Con, Fantasy Flight Games announced Keyforge, which is the world's first unique deck game. This game is a card game where there's 104 quadrillion different unique decks and every deck you get is yours and no one else will have it and you play against other players with that deck. Now it's designed by Richard Garfield, who's the one that brought us Magic the Gathering back in the 90s and it really started the collectible card game industry making it what it is today and this is his next big project. It's going to be coming out later in Q4 of this year, uh, but today we are going to be talking with Richard about the different things around Keyforge. So without further ado, let's get started. All right, well, as promised, we have the one, the only, Richard Garfield joining us. Richard, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so for anybody that has not yet heard about Keyforge, how would you describe it? Uh, Keyforge is a project I've been thinking about for a long time, but it's a key attribute is that every deck in the game is unique. Uh, so, so they've actually got unique card backs and unique names on the back, uh, so that uh, you can't mix your decks with any other deck. Wow! And so, how long, or how did you even come up with this idea, and how long did it take to sort of develop this into what it is now? Well, I first start started thinking about this in the '90s, uh, and and it stemmed from uh, the disappearance of trading card game leagues. They, we used to play trading card games in uh, a way where uh, everybody would have a limited pool of cards and they would keep that pool coherent during the course of the league, which was sometimes last weeks or months. And uh, I really liked that way of playing because uh, playing low level uh, trading card game decks doesn't mean playing with less skill, it just means your tools aren't as powerful. And you really had to make use of what you had. Uh, and it might not be the same uh, sort of thing you'd see in advanced level play or advanced level decks. And, uh, and, and the variety was often larger. But the problem was that they were hard to maintain because uh, uh, all your cards looked the same. So if you were in several leagues, you could get them mixed up and they'd end up getting mixed up with your other cards. And uh, unless you had some sort of master server, you couldn't track down what your cards were. So I began to think of ways of uh, marking all the decks so that they could uh, uh, play in a coherent fashion indefinitely. Okay. So... How, how, like you said, you thought about this in the 90s. So this was sort of obviously after Magic the Gathering had started to sort of pick up and do its thing. And and so from the 90s, when did it actually sort of become uh, more than just an idea, but actually like, wait a minute, let's just start playing with this a little bit and, and let's see what we could make of it. Like what, what kind of time frame was that from the first sort of, hmm, this might be a good idea? Uh yeah, probably the first time I began thinking about it was you know late '90s, like uh, '97, '98. Um, but uh, it was clearly a pipe dream then. Uh, all the only solution I could find was printing a unique number on the back, and I wasn't really interested in that. Um, and uh, I began thinking about it again, uh, maybe four years ago. Uh, I I began to suspect that uh, that the printing capabilities we had access to could actually do what I wanted to do, which was print these unique decks. And, and I immediately began uh, working on different designs because uh, uh, the challenges here are different than making a trading card game. Uh, you don't have to have mana, for example, or some overt balancing system like that. Uh, and, uh, and you can really explore some weird deck constructions. And uh, I would say it was a... a Maybe a year and a half later, I had a design I really liked, and uh, um, I've went. I, I actually I, at that point, I actually uh, contacted uh, Cardamunde and uh, asked them whether this was something that that could actually be done. Um, and they said it was just they were just getting the capability of doing it. 
And uh, then I went to talk to uh, Fantasy Flight, which was one of the few publishers I could think of that would have the uh, power to actually get this done and to support it properly. And uh, and that was two and a half years ago. And uh, here we are today. Wow. Yeah, that was actually one of the things I wanted to ask you about is like with how complex all these unique, unique decks are and the way the printing has to go. I assume that that probably limited the number of publishers that you might be able to approach with this idea was would you say that would be true? Uh, yeah, absolutely. There, there's a, a, a very short list. Um, and uh, I've been wanting to work with uh, Fantasy Flight for a while. Uh, the president at the time, uh, Chris Peterson, uh, uh, I had gotten along quite well with him. And uh, we seemed to see eye to eye in a lot of different games. And he seemed like he'd be a good person to work with. So uh, that was the first, first place I went. Wow. So... <laughs> Did, did you, when you first approached them with this idea, were they like, oh yes, this is amazing. I'd love to go in this direction. Were they like, no, you are just crazy. Like what was their response? Yeah. Um, I think, uh, I think I knocked them off their feet. I think that they were really impressed. Uh, we, uh, I've, uh, I, I went out there unsolicited, uh, and, and had a presentation and, uh, um, and went through this presentation. I had playable decks. I actually went to the trouble of having some decks printed up that looked pretty darn good, and uh, and and they were on board almost immediately. Well, that's that's amazing because you knew that the you know the list was going to be short of who you could approach, and you, they they were just like, well, yes, that must have been like a cool feeling for you. But now, as you were getting these decks together, uh, so for those that don't know that we didn't mention at the beginning, is this game, Richard, if I'm correct, uh, is going to be out in Q4 of this year. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so yeah, That's it's not out yet. Uh, I've recently got my hand on two unique decks and have done a review, and I've done uh, you know, a little bit of a playthrough to get a feeling for how things go. But um, how did you come up with how many sort of unique cards from each of the seven houses? So the game has basically... You know, some people call them, think of them as factions, but there's seven different houses. And from each of those, there's a certain amount of uh, different cards. So how did you come up with what's the right number of houses? What's the right number of cards per house? How did you come up with all that? And, uh, you know, take me through the process that you went through to kind of figure out what the right numbers were. Every Keyforge deck comes with uh, three different houses, three different factions. Um, and... On your turn, you can activate one of them, which means you can play as many cards from that faction from your hand. You can discard them from your hand. You can use ones you you previously had in play. And so my first prototypes had uh, six different houses. And I was uh, wondering how many I should have. Uh, and there was a certain aha where I realized that the number I really wanted was seven. And the reason for that was because when I were playing with six, because I could have gone with six, but when I was playing with six, I realized that if I had houses A, B, and C, there was only one deck in the universe that was opposite of mine, uh, D, E, F. And by adding a seventh house, suddenly there were a number of different flavors of completely disconnected houses. And uh, that felt to me to be in the right area. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's it's just amazing. Now I've read online that uh, there's t a possibility of 24 quadrillion different unique decks. Does does that sound about right to you? Uh, the number I read is 104 uh, quadrillion. Okay. 104 um, quadrillion. Okay. And I haven't uh, I haven't checked that. Uh, um, I'm sure it's a lot. I know that an exact number is is really hard to get because uh, um, we have algorithms that uh, that that fuss with things a little bit. Now I've heard from some other big name designers, uh, for example, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard like designers at the statue of like Reiner Knizia when when he approaches a, pub a publisher with a design, you know, the design is the design, and it doesn't ever really get touched, and there's not a lot of development. It's, it's take it like this or don't take it. And I don't know if that's normal for some of the more bigger name uh, you know, designers uh, in that Epsilon, like, and I would obviously say that you're up in that area. And I'm wondering, for your designs, uh, on an average design for you, not that everything's average, but, you know, if you think of all your designs and you think of them as a statistical average, how many of those go through a good amount of development with publishers versus maybe already being pretty much done and they just take it as it is? And versus that average, how did Keyforge fit into that with the amount of development that the publisher did? 
Um, my games, usually I collaborate a lot with the publisher. Uh, I have some designs, certainly, that are essentially untouched. Um, and those tend to be uh, simpler designs, like uh, King of Tokyo and Bunny Kingdom. Uh, and those those actually, uh, I don't want to say they didn't have any development. They had very good developers I was working with, but uh, but it was very, very close to what I brought to them. Um, with more complicated games like this, uh, I definitely need uh, publisher support, both in playtest and development. Uh, and uh, and I would put this at a higher end of a uh, of, uh, publisher uh, development. Um, now that said, uh, the the team was was very respectful of my approach and uh, and uh, often had to uh, work very hard to get me to change my mind on certain things. But they did. There were some major. There, there were a few major changes to the game uh, and uh, as it went along. And uh, and uh, and in the end, we were all on the same page that we had made the right decision with uh, with the development. A, ga a game like this also is it's so big in the sense that uh, that the space of the space of play you're exploring is so large and is going to incorporate hopefully so many people that having a single designer as a bottleneck. Uh, I, I've always worried about that. It was one of the reasons with with Magic why. Very early on, I uh, empowered developers and designers to make their own decisions and made sure that they could uh, go uh, go in a different path than I recommended uh, as long as they listened to my recommendations. And I think that that made the game uh, bigger. It made it uh, more appealing to more people. Mm, cool. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just so fascinating because th this is such a big thing and with all those unique decks i could imagine you know of course you've got the balancing of the chains and things like that and then it's gonna be really interesting to see how that plays out as you know uh, organized play happens uh, i got a question about the app so there's there's going to be an app uh at launch that allows you to scan basically a qr code on the, the deck itself and it's it's a little vague on what it says you can do but i had heard that you might be able to actually like play online against another player that maybe scans it, but I don't even know if that's true. So can you can you give us any more information about like what will happen with that app? Uh, I I can't make any promises because uh, I don't know the time frame that they're dealing with, but uh, um, I do know we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, so uh, it's my uh, dream that you'll be able to scan the scan your code and get an online version which you can play online you know is that going to happen and in what time frame i don't know i know that you know uh, uh, fantasy flight wants that too but uh uh but you know we'll have to see uh in the shorter run uh verifying what's in the deck uh keeping track of uh tournament results or league results if you're in some sort of organized play um those are possibilities, uh, and uh, and you know that's that's probably where it will start. Cool. Uh, that, yeah, that would be amazing if if that ends up happening. But even having any type of uh, you know uh, ability to look into what's going on with your with the leagues and stuff is still cool. But man, pipe dream of having you be able to play when you scan a deck is like whoa. That would be like the the holy grail. Now you mentioned how long it took you to sort of that you've been working on this. And, uh, you know, Fancy Flight's really good about keeping really big secrets up to Gen Con. It's the one publisher that everyone really just tries to sort of guess what's going to be their big announcement this year. And, you know, it was interesting how they sort of announced that they were dropping Android Netrunner. So a lot of the people were going, hmm, maybe there's going to be a new LCG coming out that's Star Wars. And people were trying to speculate. But with all that being said, how, uh, how, for how long and how big of a project this was, how did it get kept such a good secret? And did you ever fear that, Wow, if, if even one person says the wrong thing, even just once, this could the lid could come off. How, how do you deal with that? Uh, I was certainly nervous about it. I was kind of surprised that it uh, um, that they were able to play their cards as close to the chest as they ended up doing. Uh, in particular, they did 
use a lot of playtesters. And of course, the playtesters uh, signed NDAs, but you know, it's a lot of people. And uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, and the NDAs basically are you know just telling them you know we're serious about this. It's a uh, um, and uh, so yeah, I I, I guess uh, uh, I, I was worried that it would uh, sort of become public sooner, um, and uh, been happy how they did it. And yeah, I'm kind of surprised. Yeah. Okay. So we're both surprised. That's interesting. Now, when you were designing Magic and before Magic the Gathering came out, did you have a feeling that this was going to be sort of the next big thing in gaming? Uh, you know, and when you're doing this, when you're working on Keyforge, do you have the same feeling or maybe less or maybe more? You know, you know, recently in the last few years, you know, the, the, the gaming uh, area in general, you know, has has the revenue has gone past you know, a billion dollars a year, but like 750,000, a million of that, 75% of it is basically from the collectible card games, like basically magic. And it's such a big thing. Did you ever really think, wow, this is going to be big? And then how do you feel about this going into it? Um, well, magic took me by surprise. Uh, I knew that it was something special, but um, I had known many games, which I really liked, which, you know, hadn't... Uh, hadn't done a lot, so I wasn't getting my hopes up. And for the first several years it was out, I was sort of constantly surprised. It was like I was constantly waking up from a dream and it was like, oh, you know, it's even uh, bigger than I thought before. Um, and uh, so it was a very exciting time. Uh, what what are my thoughts about Keyforge? It's it's hard to say. I'm trying to keep my head in the in the same sort of space. Uh, I'm I'm really excited about the possibilities of this sort of game, and uh, I hope that I've gotten a design which is uh, uh, close enough to its potential that it can uh, that that it can you know really get a following and uh, and and deliver some excellent gameplay. Um, but uh, but time will tell, and uh, and uh, I will. Uh, I'm trying to think about what my next unique deck design would be in case uh, in case uh, one is needed. <laughs> well, that, that segue is good to one of the other things I wanted to ask you is, do you think the world of Keyforge will ever expand? And you kind of just alluded to, well, maybe, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, Keyforge should expand in the sense that it, it should come out with new cards and new houses and such in the future. Ooh. That, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm already excited just with what's there. You know, I, I had spoke about in my review how, you know, I, I found a few of the factions, uh, the houses that I really liked. And it was like, ooh, it's really cool. Once I find like three of my favorite houses, then I want to try to find the deck that has those three and then kind of play with those. But, you know, when thinking of, of, of Magic the Gathering, I, I actually played it a little bit in college. Um, I enjoyed it, but I never got like super, super into it because... I, for me personally, tracking down the cards and, and, and having this whole economy of it and, you know, I felt like whoever spent the most money, you know, had a better chance of winning and I, I like to play casually and, and I, but I didn't want to spend all this time researching the different possible cards that are out there and trying to find those and making my own deck, you know, and I felt the same about Star Wars Destiny that I really love, but I like to just play with the starter decks and just have fun with those two decks. We know each other's decks and you just play it and I really like that, but then this is just perfect for me because I can play a game that is just infinitely cool that every battle is going to be different and I don't have to worry about the creating your deck. So the question for you is, you know, do you think that players that love magic will even give this thing a shot? Or you do you just think they're going to say, you know what, wow, random decks, there's no way that can work. Or do you think, you, or are you trying to maybe bring some of those that, that to see that, you know, maybe they can play both. But what do you think about this? Um, I, I think that uh, that there are definitely going to be some people who uh, are into trading card games who are interested in this. Um, but the people who are really into trading card games, uh, it's unlikely that they will be uh, at least immediately interested because that group has been selected uh, to really like deck construction. And deck construction is a, a really rewarding uh, past time, right? It can absorb all your time, and uh, and it's a uh, it's a uh, a lot of people really love it. Um, but uh, 
but there's a lot of people who it's too much time or uh, or they feel like they can never make a deck as better as good as the ones that are posted or uh, um, they are like you where they would prefer uh, just having a deck and ex and exploring the play that that results in. Uh, and so uh, I think those people, uh, many of who have tried trading card games, but, you know, wandered off to other places, uh, might find a home in uh, unique deck games. Yeah. And you just kind of spoke a little bit about what I thought was fascinating. In the rule book, you wrote a really cool thing about this whole thing, the difference between the jungle and an amusement park. And... Uh, I'll just let you say it because I, I, I mean you're going to do a much better job than me. So take the list, uh, the watchers, the viewers about you know through this whole uh, this idea between those two. For a long time, I've been really fascinated with uh, excellent random content. Uh, it feels like it's true exploration to me when I'm in a world uh, that has been randomly generated using good algorithms, and uh, and so here I'm talking about things like you know say Minecraft. Uh, and, and the difference between Minecraft, uh, or a game like it, or Dwarf Fortress, I love that game, um, and, uh, uh, and a game like, uh, Skyrim, say, uh, Skyrim has, uh, an amazing world, but it's been, you know, it's like every part of it has been, uh, carefully constructed. And so I began to think of the difference between these two things as being like an amusement park, which is uh, Skyrim. It's carefully constructed. Every part's been gone over. And a Minecraft where uh, it's more like uh, the jungle. You just don't know what you're going to find out there. Uh, and you really get the sense when you're going around that the designer themselves have never seen what you're seeing because uh, the world feels in some ways more genuine. And... Uh, uh, my my game design has always tended more towards the jungle. I really like uh, uh, the games to feel like they provide opportunities for play and uh, uh, strategic settings such that the players feel like it wasn't set up carefully like an amusement park, but it is something which they're discovering themselves and maybe the first persons to look at. So, uh, and, and so in that sense, uh, Keyforge is a real jungle. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it's like, we, we don't know what decks are out there. We don't know what possible synergies there are. An analogy, by the way, uh, uh, or a, uh, a further example of that is, is I love in magic loved in magic when players would find combinations and decks we didn't anticipate there were a lot of players back in the day who thought we crafted and put all the best decks in there and uh and i always like to give you know put out these tools and uh make the combinatorics such that we couldn't really hope to figure out what would work and what couldn't uh the world would have to decide that and and so that was my appeal again in designing to the jungle rather than to the amusement park. Yeah, and it, I think it totally fits too, because like you were saying, you, you loved finding cards that were sort of underpowered, but finding interesting ways, uh, you know, to use them against people. Find that's to you that seemed cooler, and I, I I like that too. So that, that that's just a really cool way to look at this. I'm gonna now you have a lot of very popular games other than Magic. I mean, you think of King of Tokyo, um, you think of Bunny Kingdom, and but sometimes there's games that come out that some people, like myself, think are amazing, but for some reason they never catch fire. For example, Treasure Hunter. This was a sort of family-level drafting game that you put out uh, a few year, handful of years ago, maybe three or four years ago, and I love this game. It is like the best go-to, you know, 30, 45-minute sort of drafting game that works well with two because you got a cool little drafting, uh, you know, variant there of how, of how it works. And it's just such an awesome game. And for some reason, it just hasn't really taken off. So what, how do you even go about processing? Like, hmm, like when you, when, when you put a game design together, uh, I'm sure every single one of them you put together, you're like, oh, this is going to be great, right? And, but then you have ones like this that just for some reason or another don't make it to the, the buzz that the King of Tokyo or, you know, Bunny King would do. Which, by the way, I think Treasure Hunter is as good, if not better, than some of those. 
what do you make of this when things like this happen? Uh, it's, it's often frustrating. Uh, uh, certainly, I've had enough experience with it that, uh, that it's no longer a surprise. Um, I, I, too, really liked Treasure Hunter and uh, expected more from it. Uh, it uh, I always design... Uh, a, I always design games for myself, really, where uh, there's something I want from the game world, which I'm not getting. And uh, um, Treasure Hunter... Uh, gave me the drafting I wanted, but had the uh, had I think the level of casualness which I wanted, where where you could uh, draft by instinct, you didn't have to do it super scientifically, uh, like I feel like you have to do in Seven Wonders. Now, Seven Wonders is an excellent game. Uh, I think it's uh, it's perfect for what it is, but but this uh, this was this particular game was designed. Uh, to be lighter than that, um, and uh, uh, and and fill that need, and I think actually one of the problems with it was it came out in at a time when people saw Seven Wonders as a, the drafting game, and there wasn't really much else. I mean, there were a few others that were just starting to come up. Uh, right now, drafting is sort of kicked into a, another another gear where it's uh, more viewed as a, a an entire game genre, uh, which is great. That's uh, certainly where I think it ought to be. Cool. Uh, yeah, well, I, I know even an expansion had come out with it that I had gotten to kind of change the, the, the way things work with the, uh, the the goblins that stole the gold and stuff like that. So I'm glad, it, at least, I mean, it must have had enough success to get at least an expansion. But uh, yeah, people, if you haven't played Treasure Hunter, you need to go play it. It's probably going to be, I don't know, I'm assuming that uh, maybe it's sold out by now because it's been out for a while. But if not, check out Treasure Hunter. So my last question is, uh, are there any games that uh, that you're working on that are coming out, you know, in, in the somewhat distant future that we, that you can talk about that people get excited about? Well, it's not a paper game, but uh, Artifact with Valve is a electronic trading card game that uh, I've worked with them on for I think three years now, and uh, and so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, and. Uh, Outside of that, I think the only one I can really talk about is uh, is is uh, Keyforge. So, different designers work different ways. Uh, you know, I was talking with Eric Lang at the at Gen Con recently at the the Simon press party, and, and we were talking about how he has so many designs going on at once, like a ridiculous amount, and he works on a little bit one here and a little bit one there, and he's constantly bouncing back and forth. And other people like to have like one design they're working on and it is their life for however long it takes to, to kind of design it and then they move on to something else. Where do you fall in that spectrum? I am uh, kind of in between those two. I, I work on one game at a time generally, but, uh, but I don't finish it. I uh, will work on it until I start sensing myself going in circles and then I put it aside and work on something else. And when I return to the game, which if it's a high priority game, I will, you know, within a few weeks, if it's a low priority game, I will, you know, maybe years later. But whenever I do return to it, uh, I have a fresh perspective and, uh, and I'm able to discard mechanics that aren't working as well as they should. And uh, I have my brains in a different space, so I'm able to bring new things to bear. Um, so I would put myself between those two. I, I, uh, I definitely, at any given point, I'm working on one game, but uh, but it's unlikely to be finished in that go. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Thanks for telling me about that, those iterations. That's really interesting. Well, look, uh, Richard, I just want to thank you a lot for coming on here. I'm sure a lot of people, you know, there's also a lot of buzz about Keyforge, and I wanted to thank you for coming on my channel and being able to talk about it a little bit more in depth, getting more people excited about it. So again, thanks so much for joining. No, it's a pleasure. Thanks for the interest. I always love picking the brains of different types of people in the industries, publishers, designers, but to have someone like Richard on, wow, that was amazing to hear not only about Keyforge, but a little bit of his design process. Uh, it was just excellent. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did doing it. And this has been the Game Boy Geek, helping you find and enjoy the next board game you'll love. This video was sponsored by Miniature Market's Review Corner. The Review Corner features podcasts, video, and written game reviews by gamers for gamers. 
Miniature Market, the online gaming superstore. Thousands of board games, discounted prices. Check them out at miniaturemarket.com. 